Today's learning objectives will be to revise basic neuroanatomy, briefly review the different MRI sequences and their purposes, and use this knowledge to look at some cases. Firstly, we will look at how images are presented. Images are taken looking at the patient's feet upwards and can be manipulated into three planes 90 degrees to each other, axial, coronal and sagittal. In the axial plane, images are shown as if you have cut through the patient horizontally through the trunk. In the coronal plane, the patient is facing you and you have cut them vertically, separating the front from the back. And finally, sagittal, where you've cut the patient 90 degrees to both axial and coronal planes, separating the patient's left and right so you can see them in profile. So, on the axial plane, the right of the patient is on the left of the image, whilst the left of the patient is on the right of the image. Anterior, or the face, is at the top, whilst the posterior is at the bottom. In the coronal plane, the right of the patient is again on the left of the image, and the left of the patient is again on the right of the image. The superior, or top of the head, is at the top, and the inferior, or towards the neck, is at the bottom. And finally, in the sagittal plane, the superior, or top of the head, is at the top of the image, the inferior, or the neck, is at the bottom, whilst the anterior, or the face, is at the left of the image, and the back of the head, or posterior, is at the right of the image. We will now review some neuroanatomy. Here we have a snapshot of the front of the brain, taking a closer look and working from outside to inside. Purple represents the skin, subcutaneous tissues in fact. The red represents the skull, and between the skull and the brain are several layers of meninges, not usually visible unless there is an abnormality. However, we can see the CSF filled space between the arachnoid mater and pia mater. The arachnoid is closely attached to the skull and the pia to the brain. The space is below the arachnoid and hence is called the subarachnoid space. The falx cerebri and tentorium cerebelli are exceptions in that they represent the dura and can be seen in even in the absence of abnormality. Here, the falx is represented by the orange dashed line. The tentorium cerebelli is more posterior and will be seen on the next slide. Looking at the posterior aspect of the brain, the red dashed line represents the tentorium cerebelli separating the cerebellum from the cerebral hemispheres. The brain stem is highlighted in purple, anterior to the cerebellum highlighted in green. Again, in the coronal plane, the orange dashed line represents the falx cerebri separating the right cerebral hemisphere from the left. The red dashed line represents the tentorium cerebelli separating the cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellum, highlighted here in green. In the sagittal plane, the falx cerebri is not seen, but you can still see the cerebral hemisphere in blue, the brainstem in purple, and the cerebellum in green. The brain is surrounded by CSF in the sulci, fissures, basal cisterns and centrally within the ventricles. In between the folds of brain, or gyri, which is plural for gyrus, are CSF's filled spaces called sulci, which is plural for sulcus. Taking a closer look at the CSF spaces in the brain, the interhemispheric fissure in yellow separates the two hemispheres, and the lateral ventricles are paired spaces on either side of the brain, represented in blue. Slightly lower, again, the interhemispheric fissure demonstrated in yellow and the two lateral ventricles are demonstrated in blue. The lateral ventricles communicate with the purple third ventricle via the foramen of Monroe. The sylvian fissures, highlighted here in orange, separate the frontal and temporal lobes. CSF in the basal cisterns, highlighted in green, surrounds the brainstem, and the fourth ventricle, shown in dark red, communicates with the third ventricle.
Now we will focus on some of these structures in the sagittal plane, as well as look at the pituitary fossa. CSF flows from the third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. Anterior to this in the pituitary fossa is the pituitary gland highlighted in yellow and the pituitary stalk is seen above this highlighted in green. Finally, the optic chiasm lies above the pituitary gland. On the next slide, we will focus on the structures around the brainstem and in the inner ear. On this snapshot, we can see the right and left ears. The small spiral shaped object represents the cochlea. These crescent shaped objects are the semicircular canals. The orange lines are paired structures emanating from the brainstem to these structures and represent the facial and vestibular cochlear nerves. And finally, anterior to the brainstem is the basilar artery. The brain has paired anatomical areas or lobes. The larger frontal lobes in yellow are separated from the relatively smaller purple parietal lobes by the central sulcus. The light blue temporal lobes are separated from the frontal lobes by the sylvian fissure and the occipital lobes in red are posterior to the temporal lobes. Anterior to the cerebellum is the brainstem. The brain is composed of white and grey matter. The grey matter has relatively fewer myelinated axons but more cell bodies compared to the white matter. The chordate nucleus, lentiform nucleus and thalamus are important grey matter structures within each cerebral hemisphere. Damage to the chordate or lentiform nucleus may lead to movement disorders, whilst damage to the thalamus can lead to a variety of different problems including thalamic pain syndrome, sensory motor disorders and even coma. The corpus callosum is a white matter tract located in the midline extending over the lateral ventricles to connect the two cerebral hemispheres. The anterior aspect is called the genu, whilst the posterior aspect is called the splenium. The two vertebral arteries form the basilar artery. The two internal carotid arteries and the basilar artery give rise to the anterior, middle and posterior cerebral arteries, forming the circle of Willis. The brain is drained by venous sinuses, superficial and deep cerebral veins. However, for the purposes of time, we will solely focus on the venous sinuses. The inferior sagittal sinus drains into the straight sinus and, along with the superior sagittal sinus, form the transverse venous sinuses on both sides of the brain. These then drain into the sigmoid sinus and from there into the internal jugular vein. We'll briefly discuss the various sequences, but not dwell too long on the physics as this is a separate lecture in itself. Patients lie down in the scanner and images are obtained to bring out different aspects of the brain tissue, and these are called sequences. The main differentiator is whether it is a T1 or T2 sequence. On T1, white matter is whiter than grey. These can then be further modified. For example, we can use intravenous contrast to bring out areas of abnormality. The contrast will appear white, so we need to reduce the areas which are also white, such as fat, so it doesn't hide the contrast. A before and after contrast image allows comparison to show which areas take up contrast. Similarly, there are various T2 sequences which are useful to tell us about the different tissue characteristics in the brain, normal or abnormal. We can suppress or hide the fat signal, similar to the way we do on T1. We can also do the same for water, and this is called flare. DWI and ADC come as a pair and can help us identify problems such as a stroke, whilst SWI and T2 star both tell us about the presence of blood, so are used separately rather than together. For terminology, things that appear white we call high signal, whereas things that are black we call low signal. Although we can see the blood vessels on the previous T1 and T2 sequences, we can highlight them further either with or without contrast on MRI. And this is called MRA or MR angiogram if we are focused on the arterial system 
whereas if our focus is on the venous system, this is called an MRV or MR venogram. Of note, we will not use all of the T2 or T1 sequences, MRA and MRV for every patient, but rather we would pick and choose depending on the clinical scenario. Now on to some cases so we can put this knowledge into action. Our first case is of a 77-year-old female patient who presented with an unresponsive episode, preceding drowsiness, left-sided facial droop and slurred speech. She is known to have a, had a previous stroke and is on medications for hypertension. On the DWI sequence, we can see an area of high signal in the right thalamus, with low signal on the ADC, and which is matched with a high signal on the T2. This represents an acute infarct or stroke. Here is another example of an acute infarct or stroke. This is a 92 year old male patient who presented with sudden onset, right sided blurred vision. We can see in his left occipital lobe that there's an area of high signal on the DWI, low signal on the ADC, and high signal on the T2. This represents an acute infarct. In comparison, this is a 66-year-old female patient who is known to have had a previous stroke in 1998. Here we can see on the DWI, in the right occipital lobe there is an area of low signal abnormality, which is high on the ADC and also high on the T2. This represents a chronic infarct or an old stroke. This is a 75-year-old female patient who has been thrombolyzed for a stroke and was not improving, so an MRI was requested for further evaluation. On the coronal T1, we can see an area of high signal adjacent to the right sylvian fissure in the white matter. This is matched by an area of low signal on the axial T2 and also low signal on the T2 star. Furthermore, posterior lateral to this, in the right temporal lobe, there is another area of low signal abnormality on both the T2 and T2 star. This represents an acute parenchymal hemorrhage. This newborn baby was imaged because of a difficult vaginal delivery, initially attempted with forceps, then converted to caesarean, and the clinical team were concerned about increasing head circumference. A previous CT had shown a right parietal skull fracture and an extra jaw hemorrhage. The MRI confirms this with a biconvex area of signal abnormality in the right parietal region. This is an extradural hematoma. This is a 71 year old male who recently underwent neurosurgery and an MRI was performed for post optical assessment. On the T2 star and the T2 we can see an area of signal abnormality along the left side of the brain which does not conform to one of the lobes. In addition, on the T2 star we can see areas of low signal, which means that this represents blood. On the pre and post contrast images of the same patient, we can again see the collection. However, there is no contrast enhancement demonstrated within the collection itself. Putting all these images together, this patient has a subdural hematoma secondary to the recent surgery. Case number six is a 73 year old female patient who underwent a CT4 headache. She was found to have an abnormality on the CT and an MRI was organized for further evaluation. Here we can see a rounded area of low signal abnormality in the right temporal lobe. The orange line highlights the sapiginous structure which represents the right MCA or middle cerebral artery. This is connected to the signal abnormality we can see. On the MRA, this round signal intensity shows the same signal intensity as all the adjacent vessels. Putting this together, this is an intracranial aneurysm arising from the right middle cerebral artery. Our next case is a 50 year old male who presented with sudden onset confusion and difficulty finding the right words. On the venogram, we can see the normal right sided transverse venous sinuses highlighted by the yellow arrows. However, this is missing on the patient's left, in keeping with the venous sinus thrombosis. In addition, on the SWI sequence, 
we can see an area of low signal abnormality adjacent to the transverse sinus, indicating a bleed associated with this thrombus. This is a venous sinus thrombosis complicated by parenchymal hemorrhage. Our next patient is a 44-year-old female who presented with double vision, dizziness, cerebellar signs and hyperreflexia. This had been going on for several months and she underwent an MRI to investigate further. On the axial brain sequence we can see a bright lesion next to the fourth ventricle but also multiple lesions in the cervical spinal cord and perpendicular to the lateral ventricle. This is a case of demyelination or multiple sclerosis. Our next case is a 56 year old female who presented with a headache, six week history of intermittent confusion, memory loss and visual disturbance. Her family had also noticed a change in her behaviour. There was an abnormality on the CT and this MRI was performed to further assess it. As we can see, there is a large irregular mass in the left temporal lobe with no further masses demonstrated. On the pre and post contrast images, the single lesion is again highlighted with peripheral irregular enhancement. On the DWI and ABC, there is some faint signal abnormality. Putting this all together, this is a 56 year old female with a subacute history of confusion with a single irregular mass lesion in the left temporal lobe with peripheral contrast enhancement and mild areas of signal abnormality on the DWI and ADC sequences. On histology, this turned out to be a glioblastoma. Case number 10 is another mass. This time, the patient is a 52-year-old male who presented with an acute onset confusion, forgetfulness and lightheadedness for the past two weeks. He was unable to recall the time of day, location and his address. Here, we can see a mass where we would expect to see the splenium of the corpus callosum. In comparison to the glioblastoma previously, this mass enhances fairly uniformly. And on the DWI and ADC, this mass shows bright DWI signal which is matched with low signal on the ADC. Bringing all these together, this patient also has a single mass lesion, but focused on the splenium of the corpus callosum. It is irregular, with fairly uniform contrast enhancement, but also marked signal abnormality on the DWI and ADC. Putting all these together, this turned out to be a primary CNS lymphoma. Our next patient is a 56-year-old female who presented with visual changes in her left eye. On this coronal image, the fat has been suppressed so that we can see the optic nerves more clearly. In the normal right eye, we can see the normal low signal of the optic nerve, surrounded by a rim of high signal CSF in the optic nerve sheath. On the left hand side, we can see that the normal signal of the optic nerve has been re replaced by high signal. Looking slightly further back from where the optic nerves originate at the chiasm, we can see an irregular mass lesion compressing the optic nerve on the left with a rim of high signal fluid or CSF around it indicating that it's outside the normal brain tissue. On the sagittal flare and T2 sequences we can appreciate the mass lesion again. Of note on the sagittal flare we can see that the mass lesion has a broad base with the skull is separate from the pituitary gland which looks normal and there are no lesions perpendicular to the corpus callosum like that we saw in the multiple sclerosis case. There is relatively little signal abnormality on the DWI and ADC. The final T sequences are the pre and post contrast where the mass lesion shows intense contrast enhancement. Bringing this all together, we have a mass lesion around the area of where the optic nerves lie, which is outside of the brain tissue and enhances with contrast. This is a meningioma that is compressing the left optic nerve, causing the patient's visual symptoms.
This chest x-ray demonstrates a lung cancer in a 67-year-old female who presented with visual changes and headaches. She was seen by an ophthalmologist and found to have a left homonymous hemianopia. Here on the T2 sequence, we can see that she has an area of signal abnormality in the right occipital lobe. On the pre and post contrast images, we can see there is an irregular focus of enhancement. But also, next to the left sylvian fissure is a smaller focus of contrast enhancement, not as easily seen on the T1 pre contrast or on the previous T2. The findings of multiple enhancing lesions would be in keeping with metastasis from the patient's lung cancer. The next case demonstrates the importance of the clinical history when interpreting images. Here is a 56-year-old male non-smoker who recently returned from Cameroon with a two-week history of productive cough, right-sided pleuritic chest pain, night sweats and weight loss. Here, his chest x-ray demonstrates an area of consolidation in the right upper zone. He reported headaches, so an MRI was performed. There are multiple areas of signal abnormality on T2, with no appreciable change on pre-contrast T1, while enhancement after contrast was administered, matching the areas of abnormality on the T2. The patient underwent a lumbar puncture, and tuberculosis was isolated from their CSF. However, if we were given the history of lung cancer instead of TB, these could easily be interpreted as multiple metastases. Moving on to our next case. This is an 84-year-old male patient who presented with fever, word-finding difficulties, headache, and raised CRP and white cell count. On this T2 sequence, we can see an area of abnormal signal intensity in the left parietal occipital region. Here, on the pre- and post-contrast T1, we can see irregular peripheral contrast enhancement, similar to our patient with glioblastoma. However, on the DWI and ADC, we can see uniform high signal intensity on the DWI with low signal intensity on the ADC. In addition, there are areas of signal abnormality which match this found in the ventricular system. So, to bring this all together, this patient has an area of abnormal signal intensity with irregular peripheral enhancement but also high signal intensity on the DWI, low signal on the ADC, with extension into the ventricles. Combined with a history of fever and raised inflammatory markers, this gives us the diagnosis of abscess with ventricular extension or ventriculitis. Our next two cases are also of mass lesions. However, the history and anatomy will help us narrow down the diagnosis even further. Here is a 44-year-old male patient who presented the left-sided sensory neural hearing loss. We can easily appreciate the large, irregular mass lesion compressing the brainstem and the cerebellum on the left-hand side. What will help us is identifying the key structures adjacent to it and where we would expect the normal structures to be. Here are the cochlear and semicircular canals, highlighted in yellow. On the right-hand side, we can easily appreciate the vestibular cochlea and facial nerves. However, on the left-hand side where the mass exists, we cannot see the nerves. This leads us to the diagnosis of vestibular schwannoma. Our final case is of an 84-year-old female patient who presented with bitemporal hemianopia, confirmed on clinical examination. Here, we can appreciate a large mass lesion in the pituitary fossa extending upwards to compress the optic chiasm. This leads us to a diagnosis of a pituitary macroadenoma. So in summary, we have reviewed basic brain anatomy, briefly discussed the various MRI sequences used to examine the brain, and applied this knowledge to recognize different pathologies and their imaging characteristics.